Nadia, you're all right. <laughs> Good, thank you. Are you? Yes, I am. Thank you. Fab. So I've got with me today Lorna, who is a SENCO, Special Edu Educational Needs Coordinator. Is that right? It is, yes. <laughs> Fab. Uh, Lorna's going to answer a few questions for us. We'll start with what, what is a Special Educational Needs Coordinator? Every school has to have a special needs coordinator and it's, it's the link between the parents, the children, uh, other professionals, teachers within the school, just making sure that, they, that all children um, get the provision and uh, the support that they need to make sure that they can achieve what they need to achieve in education. Um, so it starts sort of between five and, and 25. It's, it's a full spectrum um, of children and young people does the code of practice so there's um, in lots of different settings you've got um, you've got a senko right from nursery all the way uh, all the way up just making sure that the that children and young people get the get the provision that they need to achieve in life really um, and ensure that the send policy is is a day to as well right uh, yeah. That's so, all the, the legals behind it. Yeah. So did you start as a teacher or did... I did, yeah. So I, I started off in primary school um, as a primary school teacher, 2006 now. Um, and as I've sort of developed and, and developed more of a, um, an interest in different areas um, within, within education, um, special needs is one of those things that I've got a, a passion and an interest for. So working alongside or going alongside my classroom teaching, um, I also do um, the coordination of special educational needs as well. Right. Is that, so what's a typical 24 hours like for you then? Um, well, on a teaching day, um, because I am a teacher part-time really, but on a teaching day, um, I'll ensure that my lessons are planned and prepared and ready um, ready to deliver um, with the group of children that I'm working with. And then in addition to sort of the classroom routines and um, the, the basic teaching side of it, um, I'll meet with the head or meet with other, um, other teachers to make sure that they've got no concerns about children um, that I need to do any follow-ups, that I need to make any referrals to outside agencies. Also, um, working alongside the TAs that are doing interventions, making sure that they're happy with the interventions that they're doing, and discussing any concerns that they've got with the children that they're working with. Um, if there's children that we think are coming towards the end, that have made the progress and maybe don't need to be in that intervention anymore, um, and also if there's those children where the intervention isn't having the effect that we were hoping for, it's again looking at what else we can do to support those children, um, like I said, to make sure that they achieve and that they make the progress that they need to. So there's a lot of communication really in making sure um, that we're all working together. Also talking to parents because they're sort of a, a key person within uh, within the role and it's not just about school it's about working together and triangulating between school children and parents so it's it's getting the children's voice getting the parents voice and working together to come up with the best strategy um, for the children right so when you well, just to clarify I suppose for people who have, have jumped in on this and are not sure what we're talking about when you talk about special educational needs, what sorts of things are you talking about there? And um, so there's four sort of um, there's four areas within special uh, special educational needs that we look at. And um, there's the physical um, children with physical needs, hearing, and that includes hearing and visual impairment children. You've also got children with social, emotional, and mental health needs. You've got communication and language needs. And then you've got cognitive and interaction, so your autism, your Asperger's children, um, children with speech um, issues, dyslexics, dys, um, dyscalculia as well. So there's a whole wide range, grandfather clock, <laughs> um, a whole 
range and spectrum of of children that kind of fit within the special educational needs bracket. So if there's somebody, as I say there's a parent sat at home and they're thinking, oh, I could do with speaking to, to a Senko. Um, yeah. How do they go about contacting someone like yourself? Um, so, like I say, every school has got to have a Senko. It's, it's a legal requirement. Um, so therefore, the best place to start is through either emailing the school or visiting the school office, asking to, uh, to set up a meeting or a telephone conversation with the school senko um, to, to have a discussion with them. Or it might be that you have a discussion with the class teacher and then they put you in touch with the senko as well. So certainly through going through the school, you'll be able to, you'll be able to speak to your child's um, the person in charge of special needs within your child's school. Right. So one of the readers um, of The Penniless Parent uh, asked a really sort of interesting question uh, when I said I was going to be speaking to you. Um, and she said, obviously, if somebody is, if a child is having additional support in school, that often sort of, I think in a lot of people's experience, comes hand in hand with then a bit of a victimization of that child and a bit of a target for bullies and things like that what do schools do i mean you know it's 30 plus years since i was at primary school what do schools do now to like uh try and stop that or make it not so noticeable or is that how you deal with it i don't know um i think from my experience working in a, a wide range of primary skills um Children, the way that we assess children now constantly as teachers, um, children are always working in focus groups. So there isn't that, oh, that child's got special needs or that child's lower ability, so they've got to go out and work with. Um, we've moved away from that. It's more of a, so if, for example, we are doing question marks in literacy and you have got a group of children that don't understand that, then it's those children, and it doesn't matter whether they're more higher ability or whether they're lower ability, whether they've got special needs, etc. They come together as a group, um, and they'll do some extra work with the teacher, with the TA at the time. And because a lot of small group work is going on as standard practice, when it comes to doing specific interventions with special needs children, it's not as obvious because children don't know why they're working in the group. It's just kind of a norm within the primary school. It's a lot more um, encourage the small group working, whether it's with the teacher, whether it's with the teaching assistant, whether it's part of the whole class and is sat on, um, in one table in the classroom or whether they're in a different part of the school. Because it is that normal classroom practice, it doesn't, it doesn't stand out as what it maybe once did. Um, because I think previously there was very much that stigma of, or oh, you're having to leave and you're having to go work with because. Yeah. Um, that certainly isn't the case, or not that I've experienced anyway. Um, and I think as well, if schools across the board, if schools and teachers are aware that children are unhappy and other children are, are saying things that maybe are unkind, um, then it would be addressed anywhere because it's all about making sure that children feel happy and safe within school. Um, so it is making sure that, that they do feel that. And if, if anything needs challenging or children need speaking to, then, then that would be done. So a parent sort of approaches um, a Senko and has some discussions and things. Um, how would you suggest they relay that to their child or... Do you think that that should be? So say, uh, you know, say a child is diagnosed with having dyslexia, for example. Yeah. Um, how would you suggest that parents approach that with their child? Should you tell them? Should you not tell them? Should you just, you know, let them I think find from it? my point of view, it's very much a case of celebrating children's successes and um, make them aware that everyone has... Um, strengths, everyone has successes and everyone has 
weaknesses as well. And if you can sort of look at your own weaknesses, like mine personally, um, spelling is a constant issue um, with me. So I do have to um, really work at it and make sure that if there is a word that I'm unsure of, that I put all the strategies in place of using a dictionary, of using a spell checker, asking other people, getting people to proofread my work. And by using that example, like my personal example, again, it kind of builds that, um, that understanding with the child that it's okay to ask for help. And if you are struggling in one area, then that's what the support and the extra help is going to do. So like I say, it's about celebrating their strengths because every person has got a strength, um, but also seeing it as, as the norm and that it's okay to ask for help and to put strategies in place for an area that maybe is a bit of a struggle. And I think having that open dialogue as well, it kind of makes it okay because you don't want children to, to go through life thinking, that there's something wrong, that, that the way that they're feeling or if they get frustrated over something, that it's because they can't do it or they don't know. Whereas if it's kind of like, that's okay. If you're struggling with your English, that's not a problem. We're going to put this in place to help you, to help build your confidence so then you can start to do things yourself. And it's about building that self-esteem and building that confidence because that's the last thing that we want for children is to start feeling anxious or start feeling frustrated um, because again that can lead to other issues then so I think just be open just be honest with them um, and just make sure that you're praising and raising self-esteem on the things that are successful with and also if they are starting to put strategies in place such as like for example with me if I did use a dictionary when I was at school, then it's about saying, oh, well done. Like you're trying to, to learn for yourself. That's brilliant. That's really, really good. And just encouraging that independence with them. So yeah, open so like, conversations. The only similarity I can think of there is, uh, so my kids, when they try a new vegetable or something, quite often I'll get like Rosie, she'll spit something out. I don't like that, mummy. And I just do this big, Oh, well done for trying. Good, yeah. you know, good yeah. on you for trying it. You tried it. That's fine. You know. Yeah. So I suppose it's that. It's like, yeah, you might yeah. not get the result you want, but it's like if they're trying and they're working at it, then support that. And yeah, because often as well, it can get quite tiring for them as well. So it's just about recognizing that it maybe small chunks, little and often it just gives them that that confidence to just keep having a go. It doesn't become onerous with them. So um, yeah, just open and honest, I think is is what I would go with. So um, can you only access a SENCO through the school or are there private sort of SENCO organisations, private tuition with SENCOs that you can access if you didn't want to go through the school? Um, there are. Um, there's a, within North Yorkshire, certainly, um, well, within all the local authorities, um, depending where you are, if you kind of Google search um, special educational needs, parent support, um, within North Yorkshire, it brings up um, its own parent support page um, where you can click on groups and networks and you can access um, specialists from there. So that's one sort of area and resource where you can uh, where you can get extra support. Also, if you didn't um, through speaking to your school, I know maybe if you didn't want to talk to the school, but just word of mouth, put the feelers out there. Um, you can often buy private tutors. There's more and more private tutors coming up online. I think it's just about looking at the recommendations, looking at the qualifications looking to see um, see that they're reputable and they've got um, see yeah see what other parents think as well and make sure that that you seem happy and that that you get a good feeling from them as well um, so 
So certainly out um, within North Yorkshire, like I say, you've got your parent, you've got your parent um, support out there, and then also word of mouth, speaking to other professionals, they will have different ideas and different um, ways of contacting uh, private tutors. Right. So with them, um, I've got my friends sort of vary sort of significantly. I've got some friends that sort of like myself probably have diagnosed with, I think I've diagnosed myself with a certain level of autism and you know, there's traits that you see that like, I do that, I do that. Um, yeah. So I've got friends that are sort of really quite paranoid that their children are displaying signs. And then I've got, uh, I've got another friend whose child is definitely autistic and she's really the most laid back person about it. She's no pressure on him to do anything. Um, and she's just sort of said, well, do you know what? He will learn when he's ready to learn it. And I'm not going to get myself worked up about that. Um, for, for the people at home, can you just explain some of the things that are signs that you maybe should do something about it rather than, so sort of, I suppose there'll be parents at home that are, thinking that they're just being anxious parents and that everything will work out and it'll all be okay. Um, can you give some pointers to them of what things actually might be worth getting checked out because it might be a bit more of a problem? Yeah, I think to start with, um, not that you can really compare children. Um, you, you can't. Every, every child is unique. Every child is individual. Um, but I think if you... If you get into the point where you think, oh, well, my child can't do that, sort of, even early on with walking, with talking, with feeding themselves, etc., having that discussion with health visitors, with midwives, they'll be able to sort of point in the right direction as well of, oh, well, actually, maybe we need to be looking at, and it could be something to do with speech and language, it could be something to do with autism, etc. cetera. Um, so certainly preschool, um, it's looking and it's talking and it's having that dialogue with health visitors and not being afraid to have that dialogue. I think that's the, that's the key point here. Um, if you are unsure, if you are, if you're feeling, oh, hang on a minute, I'm not, something's not quite right here. Have that discussion with somebody, health visitors, teachers within school, nursery practitioners, um, the, the professionals, it could be a GP even, um, to, to just talk and just say, I'm not sure if. Um, so like I say, if they're not socially interacting, if they're not um, coming on with their speaking, if their gross motor skills are a little bit slower um, than what you'd maybe expect a child of that age, um, if they are becoming fixated on one thing, um, then it's worth having that, that chat with somebody and just share concerns, um, especially within an education setting, because it might be that the teacher's sort of starting to notice some traits and patterns as well. Um, and quite often teachers might bring it to parents, parents might bring it to teachers. Um, and it's having that dialogue because often the children that we see at home can be very different to the children that we see in school. So again, it's about making sure that it's similar behaviours, similar patterns in both settings. And if it's not, it's again, looking at, at looking at the question, question why really. Um, and like I say, it's about parents being honest. And I know it's, it's not often easy um, if you think, oh, well, my child can't do that, but everyone else's child's doing that. And maybe it, it's just about seeing your child as an individual and thinking, okay, if there is something, then what can I do to help to support them to ensure that they can become independent, I suppose, really. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of the poem, Welcome to Holland. No. Love this poem. Let me find out made a note, Emily Pearl Kingsley is the author of it. And the general gist goes, 
Um, it's all about a parent that has um, a disabled child when they're born. And it goes, it uses the comparison between going on holiday, expecting to go to Italy, buying all the guidebooks for Italy, learning the Italian phrases, um, going to the airport, getting on the plane, going to Italy or expecting to go to Italy, land in Holland. And then it's the kind of the frustration and the hang on a minute, I'm supposed to be in Italy. Why am I now in Holland? And possibly the anger and, and how you kind of go through that journey. But actually, when you stop and have a moment, Holland's as beautiful as what Italy is. And it's just a different uh -huh. country and it's a different it's a different experience, but it doesn't mean that it's different. And yeah, you still might wish that you were in Italy sometimes, but there's still Holland there. And it's, it's kind of having that understanding that, yeah, when you give birth to a child, you're expecting, there's all these expectations of how beautiful it will be and how you'll be able to be this amazing parent, the new child will sleep throughout the night because you'll have your routines in place and all the rest of it. And then reality kind of comes and it's like, oh, oh that is not, <laughs> not up here. Um, or like you're told that your child does have some disability and it's that shock and the fact that you've got to adapt to it. And it's, it's that understanding really. And, and I think from a professional point of view, it's having, yeah, that understanding that parents maybe don't want to be in Holland they don't want to have that that child that's a little bit different they still want to be in Italy and are still finding that that kind of acceptance I suppose so it, it's again reassuring parents that it's okay that that the whole labeling of children is there to give them the support and the help that they need not only within education but as they go through life so dyslexic is prime example like if you've got a dyslexic child in primary school secondary school by the time they get to university actually it might be that that's taken on board so therefore in lectures um, the lecturers understand that they might need to record the lectures that are being done so then they're not having to write notes all the time or it might be that they get to use a laptop or that they get an extended uh, length of time when it comes to exams, etc. So it's about having that understanding and putting strategies in place to help them achieve and help them succeed in, in life. And yes, it starts in school, but it doesn't end when they leave school. It's something that's with them. And if you've got that understanding, like dyslexics now, for example, um, I'm, I'm dyslexic, then it's kind of like, all right, that's fair enough. And you kind of adapt to and make sure that, that the strategies continue to be in place. So then they can be independent. It's, it's not stopping them do anything, doing anything. It's just making sure that they continue to be independent, really. And um, yeah, so I suppose in, in your role, you're identifying those needs as early as possible and then and then putting those strategies in place for them to just make life easier. Yes. Is that, that right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think that 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 is it. I mean, like I use the example, I'm not diagnosed dyslexic. Um, it's spelling where my issue is. But because I know the strategies that I need to put in place, then it is just like, oh, right, dictionary. And I don't even think about it. It's not a oh, how am I going to, it's not that panic, it's not that anxiousness, it's just a case of, right. And it might be in the primary school that children might use the coloured overlay or they might have lists written down in their planners or in a notebook to help them just get through the day, to sequence their day, to know what's coming next, to relieve the anxiety if they've got anxiety issues. Um, and they just know that that list is there, their timetable is there. And that's just a strategy that you, they use. And that's, that's fine. That's okay to do that. So yeah, it's the norm about making them, yeah, just making them as independent as possible. And that's right from sort of a young age all the way through. It's funny because you say things like that, like, 
or having a list that's just their go-to and stuff. And I'm sat here thinking, do you know, I need to do things like that, you know, just have, have a little list to the side that's just my go-to. And if I checked that every day and got into that routine, that would probably help me a lot. And I've, I'm, you know, I've never had a diagnosis of anything. Um, obviously, I think, I think it's safe to say that going back to when uh, me and readers sort of my age in their 30s, 40s now, um, were at school, dyslexia was treated very differently. What sorts of things, if there is parents sat there now thinking, I'm dyslexic, I know I am. Um, what advice would you give to them with their children? Um, if it is within the family, there is certainly um, a high chance that the children might, um, might be dyslexic as well. And that is certainly one of the questions that we would ask um, if anyone else in the family if, or if there's a history of dyslexia in the family. I think the different strategies um, to put in place, again, um, lists and timetabling, often it's their mind so muddled with things that they can't organise themselves very well. So again, it could be if it's younger, um, having pictures of what they need to get ready for school the next day. It could be writing a list again. And so again, independent, right? You need to make sure that you've got these five things ready. For example, pack lunch, reading book, PE kit, water bottle, homework. Um, that it's all ready and that they can organize themselves ready for the next day. And as I say, depending on the age, it might be pictures, so then they can tick them off. It might be um, a checklist that they can tick off to make sure. So helping them out with their organizational um, skills is is a really good and simple simple way to um, to do it again to just relieve that anxiety that there might be um, and that frustration or that panic that they get to school and suddenly they can see everyone else with their PE kit and then it suddenly dawns on them that they need their PE kit but mum's gone to work and dad's at work and nobody can get their PE kit and then it suddenly spirals into something that so having that organisational skill as well and um, also recognising um, recognizing when they're getting a little bit stressed with things that, um, again, it's becoming too overwhelming, that the, that the writing's a little bit too much to them, that, um, they, that they can get quite tired. So if they've had a full day at school and then, um, then you're wanting X, Y and Z and you're doing more work at home, actually that can be quite become quite tiring and so it's that little and often again and just giving them that opportunity to just relax and switch off from a little bit um in terms of reading it's using sort of the, your audio books um of the easy read so the read alongside you or or a, C, a cd that's very old um, <laughs> but, <laughs> Just done that. <laughs> digital or whatever like mp3 recording so then they can enjoy the books um because again sort of reading can be tiring for them and if they're constantly trying to phonetically sound out words or getting words wrong then the story doesn't sound right in their head and then that become become frustrating and they lose that love and that passion um for reading, whereas if someone reads to them or as an audio book, they can enjoy that um, as well. So I think it's, I think that is another one. Um, in terms of writing and spelling, it's about breaking the words down into the different parts. So you could use different colours. Um, so if you are writing, um, Oh, this is why you try and think of a word, chair, for example. <laughs> so you might have one colour for the ch sound and then a different colour for the air sound. So then they can see that there's two different sounds to make up that one word as well. So um, so it's about playing with the words and making them... Um, so learning the phonics letters. Yeah, magnetic letters, writing in the sound so then they can like feel how it how it's written, etc., and just making things fun, so then they don't realise that the that they're learning 
really. So the more that you can do that at home, uh, the better, is what I would advise, suggest. I love that. I love that, that to finish on, make it fun. Yeah, <laughs> like absolutely. That. Yeah. And then they don't realise it. I know I had my um, nephew on our farm today and um, I found some sort of like chalk stone and he's just sort of starting to write and starting to mark make. So of course, chalk stone, big brick, there we were, drawing <laughs> on the side of the shed. <coughs> and he's loving it, but actually he's starting to mark make, he's starting to write and he doesn't realise it, so. Oh, fab. So yeah, just keep it, just keep it entertaining yeah. for them and keep it fun. And oh, thank you so much for talking to me. Um, from what you're saying, it's you know every every school's got a senko, and you can go and seek yours out if you've got your your own questions. Yeah, absolutely. And just um, just ask questions if you're not sure, and um, they'll be able to definitely signpost you. I'd say your local authority has got a lot of information on the, on their website as well because that's a legal requirement that they provide support as well. And if there is anybody with um, children with special needs, then there is a, a, a group um, or an agency called it's Sendias. So it's your special educational needs and disability information and advice and support. So again. Um, if if they don't want to go through schools or they've already got a child with uh, special educational needs and they're wondering what support they can access or what schools need to be doing etc then they can advise or if there's meetings going on with school and they want an advocate there with them then that's something that that Sendias can do as well so that's all on the North Yorkshire website as well oh brilliant well I'll let you get back to your evening. Thank you so much. No worries. For me. My pleasure. <laughs> Fabulous. Thank you very much. All right then. Bye. Cheers. Bye.